Hey, Michelle. Hey, Peggy. When hey, Michelle and I were talking earlier, it was over um, chat. I think she's still in a session. Oh, gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Hi. Hi, Alex. Good morning. Is it, is it morning? Oh, I guess it's morning where some people are, huh? Well, it, it's 9 a.m. here, so it's morning oh, for me. <laughs> oh, where you're in Hawaii. Oh, man. I was like, oh, is it even? Okay. Yeah, good morning then. Yeah. <laughs> it's late afternoon here. Yep. Yeah, I keep forgetting that the, the sessions are all in Eastern time, so it is oh. afternoon for you, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> All right, so let's see. Michelle just made um, made me the host, and Alex and Mary should be co-hosts now. Okay, let me just read to her really quick. Um, let's see. So the recording's paused right now. So if I don't remember to hit, uh, if you if I don't remember to start it up again, someone please ping me and let me know. Does that look good? Yeah, right. we, do, good we, do have an, we do have an intro slide if you wanna put that up, but we don't need to. It just has some, I mean, I could, we could always put the info in the chat too. It just has some like uh, information about like various links and things that people can, uh, for the conference. Let me see. Yeah, I could just copy it and put it on there. Okay, yeah, that, that'd be great. Okay, cool. And then I'll just do a quick introduction of you, Alex, and then you can take it away. That sounds good. Yeah. Okay, cool.
Hey, everybody. Um, so about, it's 3 p.m. Eastern time. So I think we will get started, even though people are still kind of trickling in a little bit. Uh, my name is Peggy Greisinger. I'm going to be the facilitator for this session, but you really won't see much of me. It's really going to be Alex's show. Um, so <laughs> uh, welcome to uh, setting up a local linked data environment on your laptop. Uh, this session is being live streamed uh, to the LD4 YouTube channel, and it's recorded, um, and it will be saved on YouTube for future viewing. I put some useful resources in the chat, and let me just add them again for the people who just showed up. Um, so it includes links to the Code of Conduct, uh, an invite to join the conference Slack channel, uh, the conference's collaborative project, as well as the name of the tech support channel and the Twitter hashtag. Um, in this session, you can indicate you have a question by using the raise hand function or putting your question into the chat. My colleague, Mary Campany, will be monitoring the chat and informing us of any raised hands we might miss. Um, now, I'd like to in introduce today's present presenter. Alex Berry is a data engineer at, I at Indiana University Bloomington. Uh, they are interested in knowledge graphs and API design. Uh, please take it away, Alex. Okay, uh, thanks. You can hear me, right? Yes. Okay, great. Um, all right, so um, as she said, uh, my name is Alex Berry, and I'm going to be presenting on um, setting up a local uh, linked data environment on your laptop. So um, I'm going to kind of, there's going to be four main um, areas I'm going to go over. First, I'm going to talk about the motivation of why you would want to be doing this. Um, I'm sure. Since you're attending this, you have your own motivations, but uh, it'd be nice to kind of just cover some of the reasons why I wanted to give this talk. Um, then I'm gonna go over some common tasks that uh, are things that you'll likely have to do regardless of what software you decide to run um, locally while you're doing this. And then I'd like to go over briefly some applications that exist. Um, all of the ones that I mentioned today are going to be um, actively developed open source projects that uh, you can, um, you know, start using this afternoon if you want to. And then I'm also going to cover some um, software libraries that also work with linked data and RDF. Um, uh, so if you're interested in uh, developing, um, that can be helpful. So. Um, I want to go over why um, working with linked data locally is worth the effort. Um, like I said, some uh, most of the software could be different than what you're used to running because uh, typically it's run, it's sort of viewed as server side software, but um, I'm going to be covering how to run it locally. Um, and there is um, there are differences that I'll go over between running. Um, uh, desktop applications and server side applications. So if you aren't familiar with those um, differences, I'll try to walk you through um, what those are. Um, so I'm hey, not going to go. Alex? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Um, we just had a question in the chat. Is there a link to the slides somewhere that we could share? Um, yeah. Um, I don't have them posted on um, the schedule mm -hmm. yet. Um, Right now, I just have markdown files, so okay. I'll, I'll okay. generate those. And if people do want to follow along with the markdown, I'll post a link to that right now. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah. And I will post um, PDFs to uh, sketch. Um, so um, I'm not gonna go through uh, in great detail setting up any particular piece of software. Um, I'll kind of do a quick rundown of, um, of one application and one um, library, but um, that isn't, I'm not, going to try to go through in depth, completely walk through. Um, there's also a lot more software available to, for working with linked data than what I'm going to mention. Like I said, I'm just mentioning some um, 
actively developed open source projects. Um, there's a lot of proprietary software that you might work with as well, but I'm not going to be covering any of that. And um, I'm just going to briefly go over some of the features of the applications and libraries. Um, they all, you know, provide a lot more functionality than um, what I am going to be going through. Um, since, um, you know, this is a remote conference, you know, I can't, you know, ideally this would be like in a room and there'd be 12 of us and we'd all have our laptops and uh, we could kind of work through some of these problems. Um, since we can't do that, um, I did actually create a um, getting started channel on the main um, LD4 Slack, uh, not the conference one. So if you haven't joined that, um, I made a getting started channel where hopefully if people do have some follow-up questions, uh, they try to work with the software. Um, I'm gonna kind of um, read that, you know, a couple times a week to see if people have questions. So um, one of the main reasons why you might want to work with software locally that I've um, found is related to the concept of developer experience. So uh, as you can guess by the name, developer experience is uh, related to user experience, but it's specifically geared towards uh, developers. And I think if you're working um, in any sort of technical uh, field, even if you aren't like a software developer, it still applies to you. Um, you still have to, you're still doing technical work with data. Um, I've done software development work and kind of data engineer work as well. And I think there's a lot of similarities between the two. So um, the hope is that, you know, you want to have a really good developer experience. And um, over the course of the past decade, I've worked on quite a few projects and um, being able to, I've really noticed my, um, how much I've enjoyed working on the project and how productive I've been, uh, how much I've been able to help people. Um, it seems like when I've been able to run, the more of the um, production environment I can run locally, uh, it tends to really help. Uh, I enjoy working on those projects a lot more. Uh, and the fact that this uh, has been such a difference and whether I've enjoyed a job or not, I know that makes me kind of lucky. I've been really lucky with um, coworkers and bosses and stuff like that. So um, across those projects, um, you know, uh, I've had positions where I've been able to run the entire system locally um, I've also worked on projects where I can run maybe my code locally, but maybe we share databases or um, external web services. Um, we have to depend on those. And I've also had jobs where I've not been able to run anything on um, my local machine. And um, in working with linked data, I think you'll there'll be the same spectrum. So you might be able to work with um, an entire data set locally. You might work with part of it locally and then federate out to some external services. Um, and perhaps um, people now are working um, fully remote. So the benefits of working uh, locally is that you can, um, you feel a lot more freedom to experiment. So you can load a bunch of data, experiment with it, maybe delete it, start from scratch, um, add things just to see what happens and not worry about um, any other. So if you like share a development database, you know, you can end up um, interfering with someone else's work uh, accidentally. Um, I worked in environments where we did share a development database and, you know, periodically we would pull in production data into our development database. And if you were working on um, something that 
required the application to be in a certain state, you'd always have to coordinate when you could pull in the um, production data to do like a refresh. And um, besides that, um, being able to run things locally also just means that you have a very, it gives you a chance to have a deeper understanding of um, the system uh, where possible faults can be um, if something happens in production. Um, you know, you've most likely seen something similar. And in the case of linked data, you would know where data sources come from. Um, if you're doing federation, then you might know when a certain data set is down or unavailable, and you would just be a little bit more familiar with um, things related to that. Um, there are some downsides to local development. Um, like I said, I'm gonna go over some of the learning curve, um, some things that you might not be familiar with. Um, also writing software that is easy to run locally um, can cause some uh, issues for the developers of that software. So their documentation has to be much um, better. Um, it could potentially make configuration a little bit more complicated because you aren't going to want to configure things the same way for local development as um, production. You could also potentially have to support different, um, uh, de you might have different dependencies. So uh, locally, you might use one database type and then in production, you might also want to support maybe like a proprietary database. And also um, you can run into problems where something works on your machine, but then it doesn't work in production and that can make um, debugging complicated. So now that I've gone over some of the background, uh, I wanna explain what I mentioned about um, the common tasks that you'll have when setting up uh, applications that aren't necessarily intended to be ran locally. And this can be uh, dependencies that you might need that uh, you typically won't have if you're just running desktop applications, uh, the configuration um, differences that I mentioned. Typically, if you're running desktop applications, you might have to do a little bit of configuration when you install it. Um, and then maybe there'll be some settings that you'll change at runtime. But um, that's pretty different when you're running something that's intended to be a server application. And similar to that, the way that you start up um, these applications and shut them down is also um, typically different. So uh, some dependencies that you might not have to deal with with um, desktop applications could be um, different runtimes that you would have to manage um, in the case of uh, applications that are written in like scripting languages, there might be shared library dependencies that'll go into. Um, it could use external databases or um, search applications like Solar or Elasticsearch. And in some cases, um, it might also depend on you having um, access to version control software. So uh, most of these applications don't ship um, binaries that are specific to a platform. Um, in the case of, um, there's gonna be quite a few Java applications that I mentioned. So in that case, there's like a shared um, binary and it requires that you have um, the Java runtime environment. And it's similar for things like Node and scripting languages as well. Um, you sort of have to have those on your machine already before you can run applications written for those. And um, on top of just um, scripting environments and things like the JVM, um, in so, some cases like RDF4J, which has a server 
Um, it also requires uh, an external servlet container. And in the case of applications written in scripting languages, um, some of them might require you to have um, a server like Apache up and running. Although that is um, a little bit less, um, less the case now than it used to be. And um, there's also things like Docker that can help manage these um, requirements, but Docker itself uh, has its own set of issues. Um, I'm not really gonna focus on Docker. I think I'll mention it once more later on. But um, even if you're using an application that runs within Docker, uh, which Docker's um, helps you set up virtual machines. So um, you basically end up running like an instance of Linux that is set up already with all the software dependencies that it needs, um, if you aren't familiar. Uh, it's still good to know um, what I'm gonna be talking about because you might have to debug um, your setup. And it's good in general to just have uh, a little bit more understanding of what's happening. So it's a little less um, magical. Like I mentioned with um, scripting languages, um, there might be libraries that um, are sort of external libraries that the scripting, the scripts you might be running depend on. Um, sometimes, um, often you have to uh, install these before you're able to run that software. Um, and every environment's gonna be a little bit different. Um, some, depend more on external commands to say, um, install these individual um, dependencies, while others have uh, more formal um, build systems or uh, package managers where within the project, it'll say what the um, dependencies are. You can also end up with uh, dependencies on um, external databases. Um, not every project uses a internal database. Um, in the case, uh, we're going to be looking at um, the Jenna software that actually has an embedded database. But in the case of a lot of applications, um, it might depend on an external uh, relational database like uh, MySQL or Postgres. And there's also um, search dependencies that come up often. Um, in the case of Lucene, it's probably embedded, um, but a lot of projects now depend on uh, things like Solar or Elasticsearch, which have Lucene embedded in them, but they're an external service. Um, luckily now, most uh, open source databases are pretty easy to install. Uh, like I mentioned, some projects um, that you'll see that are open source don't even really necessarily have very formal release processes in place. So uh, to use them, you might have to actually check out some code. Um, usually once a project gets farther along, they'll have a more formal release process, but it still could be useful to um, be at least a little bit familiar with uh, version control software like Git is kind of the go-to um, uh, version control software these days. And typically when projects aren't that far along, they'll still have pretty good documentation that'll walk through um, what exactly you need to do once you check out the code. Um, so like I was saying, um, server-side software often requires more configuration than uh, you might be used to. Um, some software is sort of, they thought of this ahead of time. So the defaults are set up for development environments um, or they'll um, tell you more in the documentation about um, what configuration needs to be done. 
Um, there's a couple common ways that configuration is handled in these applications. So it could be something like a command line argument where you might specify the port or um, maybe the authentication mechanism. Um, it could be put in external files. So you might have like a JSON file that sets up the configuration. And that could either be sort of a standard or you might have to pass that in to uh, the application when you start it. And also environment variables are common, um, especially like uh, in Docker environments, lots of times you have to set up environment variables. And um, how you do that exactly depends on what um, operating system or um, shell environment you're using. Uh, finally, for the common tasks, um, the way that you actually start and shut down these applications uh, can really vary. So um, oftentimes, um, like I said, a lot of these programs don't ship platform specific binaries. So there'll be um, oftentimes shell scripts that you have to run. Um, and just to manage them better, if you aren't used to running applications this way, uh, it's helpful to use a shell. That way um, you can see if there's any logs to standard out and also so it's easier to um, shut down the application if you start it this way. Uh, in the case of uh, databases, they're, they can be a little bit different than the actual applications. Lots of times, once you install a database, it'll just um, hook itself into uh, some functionality that your operating system provides so that it'll just always be running in the background. And it's good to be aware of that, especially if you experiment with a lot of software. It's good to know what you have running at any given time. And um, like I said, it's gonna be different for every database. So if you run MySQL locally, it's gonna be different than if you run like MongoDB locally. And uh, yeah, so, um, <laughs> to repeat myself again, documentation is really important for um, working with um, some of these. So uh, I'd like to now go over some uh, specific applications that you might um, work with. Uh, the main one that I'm going to focus on is uh, the server that is provided uh, alongside uh, Apache Jenna. But I want to mention a couple other projects first. So uh, one project that's often compared to Apache Jenna is uh, RDF4J. Um, it's uh, an Eclipse Foundation project as opposed to an Apache Foundation project that Jenna is. Uh, they're both written in Java. Uh, they provide similar functionality. There's even projects that try to abstract the differences between the two. Uh, it's a little bit more complicated than uh, Jenna, which I'll go into um, because it also depends on you having a servlet container installed. But uh, overall supports things like different serialization formats and also provides support for Sparkle, full text search, um, uh, things like GeoSparkle, and um, on top of being an application, um, the sort of server side of things, it also provides its own library to work with um, RDF directly from Java. A project that I just recently um, started looking into, haven't had too much time to try it out other than just kind of read about it, is uh, Link Data Hub. Um, it's been around for a couple of years now. Uh, it's built on top of Jenna, which is uh, fairly common. Um, uh, the reason that I haven't got into it yet is that the setup looks uh, a little bit involved, but um, it does have um, really good documentation. Uh, Protege is a little bit different than the other two um, systems. They don't, it doesn't focus directly with loading in things like um, triples that focus more on the ontology side of things. 
um it's a i didn't realize that it was as old as it uh is but it's been around for over 20 years um there's a also a desktop version of the application along with the web application um the uh, web version requires uh, MongoDB and also it uh, uses a uh, servlet container. So you'd have to work with uh, Apache Tomcat as well. Uh, another um, newer project that uh, I've been following that looks interesting. Uh, so far, I've mainly been talking about Java applications on um, for server side applications related to um, RDF and linked data. Uh, this one is uh, written in Rust, which is interesting because it uh, could eventually provide um, platform specific binaries, which would be easier for people to work with because it would actually have zero external dependencies. Um, they haven't quite gotten there yet in their development, um, but hopefully they will. And it's also interesting because it uses embedded databases. So you don't have to run an external database, which also makes things um, easier. So uh, now getting um, to um, the main application I'm going to talk about, uh, Jenna and um, uh, Fuseki, I believe it's pronounced. Uh, I might be wrong. Um, Jenna is kind of a the workhorse uh, kind of go to um rdf and linked data um library and like i said it provides also the server uh it's also written in java it's a little bit different because it actually embeds its own server so you don't have to worry about that's sort of one less external dependency to worry about so it makes it a little bit easier to run it also has an embedded database that um a triple store that they created and um, I'm not going to go through all the functionality, but it uh, provides support for all the serialization formats you would expect. Um, you can run Sparkle queries. Um, and it also provides support for um, some schema and ontology related um, projects. So uh, installing and getting it running is pretty simple. Um, like I said, it requires uh, Java. Uh, if you're on um, Mac or Linux, I'd recommend you check out uh, SDK Man to help you manage uh, Java installations. Um, if you're on Windows or if you don't want to use SDK Man, Adopt OpenJDK is a really good resource to get uh, a recent um, version of Java. It used to be a lot more annoying to try to get Java running on your machine. Um, so Jenna provides downloads on their website. So you just have to download the archive and uh, extract it. And then it has really good defaults for running locally. So all you have to do is just run uh, one of these commands and then it'll actually start the, um, the server up immediately. And once you get it up and running, um, you should see um, this when you go to a local host and it, by default, it runs on port 3030. So um, here you can see what it looks like when it starts up. And by default, there's no default data sets. So if you add a data set, uh, here I'm just loading um, some categories data from uh, DBpedia, and I'm going to make it persistent so that um, it gets stored. And it's actually a pretty big file, so uh, it took a little bit of time to run, and then uh, it handled. You can see here uh, 32 million triples locally fairly well, and uh, once you have a data set loaded you can work with it via Sparkle. So here I'm just doing a really simple uh, query just to show how that looks. Um, the editing interface is actually really nice. 
Um, it'll catch errors and does syntax highlighting. And you have various options for uh, what you want the results to look like. And then here you can see uh, the results from that query. So like I said, um, this application has a lot of features. I don't, um, I'm not really gonna go over them in detail right now, but uh, overall there's uh, good documentation on their official website that you can look at. So now I'd like to change over to looking at some libraries that you might, um, that are pretty common um, to work with uh, RDF. So you aren't limited to just what these interfaces provide. And just about every popular programming language has some support for RDF or linked data. Um, libraries typically have a more limited uh, feature um, set than a full server application. But typically, they'll have uh, support for all the popular serialization formats. Um, they'll also have an in memory um, representation of RDF, so triples and graphs and blank nodes and uh, related. Uh, they'll also have some support for calling external Sparkle endpoints and handling the results. And like I said, Every library is going to have its own set of features, so some will be a little bit richer than others. So you kind of have to look at them and see uh, which one works best for you. Um, I'm going to give a quick example, and I'm just going to focus on the Python library. That's um, the most uh, used one for RDF called RDF lib. Um, of course, to be able to use this, you'd have to first install Python. And as I mentioned with um, external dependencies that are shared libraries, um, in this case, there's a couple. Uh, when you install Python, it comes with an application called pip, and you can use that to manage um, these external dependencies. So first, uh, you have to install the actual RDF lib uh, dependency and also to do um, Sparkle, there's uh, another one called Sparkle Wrapper. And the double hyphen user means just install this for the user that I'm logged in as, don't make it uh, global. And here you can see uh, a small script that does basically what I just showed that happened in the interface in Jenna. So I'm just handling some imports uh, and then creating a Sparkle wrapper. And I actually ran this on my machine after I had um, the Jenna server running. So you can see I'm hitting a local host for 3030. And since I created a, a data set called categories, um, it's just slash categories. And then since I'm using the Sparkle endpoint uh, slash Sparkle, uh, different applications will have different um, URL patterns. Uh, then I'm just setting, saying that I want the return format to be JSON. Then I'm running the actual query. You can see that it's the same query as before. Uh, then I'm doing the actual, running the actual query. And then I'm using the built-in JSON support in um, Python to print it out. And you can see here that um, you get the same results. So this would be really useful um, if you want to automate things um, and maybe have like stored scripts to run um, commands locally. And um, there's, you know, libraries like this for um, Perl and Ruby as well, JavaScript, if you want to run stuff on Node. Um, and they all, have the same basic functionality. So it really comes down to just what you're the most comfortable with. So um, that wraps up um, what I wanted to cover. Um, hopefully this was useful for everyone. And uh, like I said, um, I'll take questions now, 
but there's also that um, channel that I made if people um, want to follow up later. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Alex. Uh, if we have, if anybody has any questions, please feel free to raise your hand or put your question in the chat. Okay, well, it looks like we don't have any questions right now, but um, as Alex said, there's a few of these options available. There's also the, um, on the LD4 Slack, the track for this one is the tools channel. So if you wanna keep discussing it, um, you can also use that avenue. Um, and uh, thank you so much. And we look forward to seeing you for the rest of the conference. Have a nice day. All right, thanks. Um, I'll stay on if people post anything on chat for a little bit, so. I'll stop. Do you want me to stop recording or? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. I'm glad you're sticking around, Alex, because it looks like a question just got dropped in the chat. Nice. Um, yeah. Um, I know there are, um, I, saw, I see the question, um, if there's any things that are zero install that might use local storage in the browser. Um, I know there there are some, like I said, there are some JavaScript libraries. Uh, I don't know offhand if any of them are currently taking advantage of things like IndexedDB, um, which is the browser database. I've seen some kind of like proof of concept um, examples, but I don't know offhand if um, there's any projects exactly like that. Uh, I think it's definitely possible and that um, it'd be nice if that did exist, but I don't think it'd be actually too much work. Um, it's just, I don't know if um, people have been focusing on that because I know that there are like JavaScript libraries that do like sparkle parsing and um, have like the um, data model and also provide things like um, serialization parsing as well. I'm just gonna turn the recording back on because I think this actually this is pretty valuable stuff. So let me just don't want to interrupt the talking. Okay. Um yeah, that's a good point about GraphDB. Um I only know about GraphDB as kind of being its own thing. Um I haven't seen too much about how GraphDB like relates to like RDF and linked data. Personally, uh, I haven't looked into graph DB too much, but oh, yeah, I was thinking, sorry, I was thinking of something else <laughs> when he said graph DB. I just had to pull it up. Um, yeah, I'm not sure offhand, I'd have to look into that more. The, um, it's, yeah, oh. it's the tools channel. Sorry. Yeah, that's just what I was going to say. So. Yep. Let me put a link into the the Slack invite channel too. Yeah, I'm personally really interested in the um, if there is a good like zero installation um, way of working with um, RDF. So 
if I find anything, I'll um, I'll be sure to post about that. Um, as far as, um, there was a question about, um, just knowing all the dependencies that you need to get running. Um, it really varies per project. So, um, like I said, it'd be, that's where good documentation is really helpful. Um, it's nice when things don't depend on Tomcat, uh, but you know, when they do, uh, it sort of just comes down to already having experience with it to some degree. And um, if you aren't familiar with it, just, you know, you have to, um, you know, spend some time to kind of get up to date with how that works. Uh, I know Tomcat isn't the easiest thing to work with. Some of the configuration can be kind of a pain, but um, hope, I think in general projects are moving away from requiring external um, things like servlet containers, like I showed with um, uh, Fuseki, where it embeds it. Um, also, um, uh, OxyGraph, the project that I mentioned, doesn't, you know, it has an embedded server and an embedded store as well, um, although you'd still have to run that locally. So uh, it's not quite like a zero install where you can just go to a web page and use local storage. Um, as far as I know, um, I don't know offhand of any zero install tools. Everything that I know of right now requires a little bit of work. Um, yeah, I, that's something that I'm interested in, but I just haven't had the time to really look into um, what exists there.
Okay, uh, it looks like there's no more questions. So um, I'll be checking both the, the Getting Started channel and the Tools channel um, to see if there's any more questions, if people think of something later. But thanks, everyone.